Welcome to Evidence for Faith. So glad you're joining me today um, in this lesson as we're, we're finishing off this series on archaeology pertaining to Daniel and how a lot of critics really attack the Bible, but one of their favorite places to attack is the book of Daniel. Um, Daniel really seems to get its lion's shares of critics attacking it. And as what we've been seeing in this series, uh, there, there's not a whole lot of archaeology pertaining to Daniel um, that has been found so far in the science of archaeology, but there have been some discoveries that have just been absolutely remarkable that we've been looking at. Well, we have another one today, and this one is really interesting. You see, critics often refer to Daniel and attack uh, Daniel's book by chapter 5. There's where they go after, and that's the feast with Belshazzar and the handwriting on the wall. And now you might be saying, well, what do they attack on this? Why do they say, critics say that, you know, you can't believe the Bible because of this? It's because most people um, are familiar with this story. I mean, if you've gone to Sunday school or, or Bible classes or anything growing up, you probably know this story very well. But it's the people who are mentioned in this one and what their titles were. There's where critics have been attacking this book for centuries. And um, this handwriting on the wall story if you recall how it's going on, there's a big celebration taking place, a big feast. Uh, King Belshazzar is holding this massive orgy, really is what it was. It was a big celebration, a lot of alcohol flowing, a lot of food and stuff like this, but a lot of alcohol. People were praising these gods of, uh, of Babylon and stuff like this. And it got really insulting to God because Belshazzar actually orders the um, the holy uh, temple of Solomon, the temples, uh, first temple that the Jews had, they, Nebuchadnezzar had taken the gold and silver things out of that um, and vessels of gold and things. And Belshazzar actually orders those things to be brought in and using the holy uh, utensils from the true temple of God, he starts toasting these idols with it. And that's what's going on is um, in this account of the story. Then, as the story continues, as they're doing this, totally insulting the true God uh, with these gods of others, you know, the Marduk and, and the god of Sin and Bel and all these others, God <laughs> is not standing by quietly. He, he takes, uh, there's a disembodied hand that appears over by the wall and starts writing into the plaster on the wall. And he writes three words on, uh, three different words on this thing. Belshazzar and the guests all see this, uh, this disembodied hand floating around writing this in the, their hall as they're doing this. And it not only horrifies them all, it, it confuses everybody present because though they could read the words, they didn't understand or interpret what the meaning was to Belshazzar. That's the story. But the point is where critics attack isn't so much that part, it's where it keeps talking about King Belshazzar and that he is the last and the final king of uh, the, the kingdom of Babylon, the Chaldeans. And so Belshazzar is so uh, confused and terrified by this. He says in the book of Daniel, anybody who can interpret the meaning of this, who can give me the meaning of this, uh, of this message coming, this supernatural message, that he would be given a royal robe, uh, he would be given a gold chain, and proclaim the third ruler of the kingdom, the third ruler. And we've talked about that in a previous lesson, why he would be the third ruler is because Belshazzar is actually the second ruler. Uh, his father, Nabonidus, was ruling um, in a different part of the, king, uh, of the kingdom, and Belshazzar was just the king there in Babylon. But eventually, you know, they can't figure out, nobody can answer the question what this is, uh, what these words mean and interpret to them. Finally, the aged Daniel, Daniel, who's very old at this point, this is near the end of Daniel's life, he is summoned before King Belshazzar as being, he's identified as a prophet of the true God and um, whose utensils are being used and profaned in this orgy. And it is Daniel that tells King Belshazzar the meeting. So let's take a look. Let's go to Daniel chapter 5, verses 25 through 30. And then I'm going to show you some archaeological evidence that is just absolutely amazing that pertains to this story. So Daniel chapter 5, verses 25 through 30. 
And this is what the writing that was inscribed, Mene, Mene, Tekal, Parsun. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekal, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Pereth, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain put around his neck, and proclaimed, pro, a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler of the kingdom. Now, that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. Then the next thing we read, and as we continue, uh, Cyrus the Persian now takes over. Now, for centuries, and here's where we get to the problem. For centuries, critics of the Bible have said that the Bible has a big mistake here, a big error in it, that the Bible is a mythical book because it names a mythical person. Because critics of the Bible, critics of the book of Daniel in particular, will say Belshazzar was a mythical king. He was a fable, a not a real person. Even today, as I travel around speaking and doing seminars and stuff on biblical archaeology, I still come across some individuals that will bring this up to me. Where they, they cite, where they get this, they cite that the Greeks and many other reliable historical records say that King Nabonidus was the last king of Babylon, and they never mention Belshazzar. So there's where the problem comes. And so for centuries, this has been uh, a difficult spot for some Christians to try to defend because the Bible specifically mentions Belshazzar as being the king, the last king of Babylon when Cyrus comes in. Yet historical documents from, from other sources, particularly the Greeks, named Nabonidus as the king. Well, that was the problem until the year 1854. In 1854, a cylinder was found. A British archaeologist by the name of uh, J.G. Taylor well, discovered four little identical cylinders while excavating at a, a ziggurat near the city of Ur, which is in present-day Iraq. Um, and he was excavating there, and he found these four little little structures. Now, these little cylinders, like you can see, we have a small little cylinder. This is one of the a replica of one of those. It's not the original. It's in a museum, of course. But these little cylinders, and you can see, it is definitely a cylinder, and it has um, Chaldean writing on it. It's it's definitely um, written all the way around. And this little cylinder, the way that they were used in, in reading these things is you would take the cylinder, like this is the library book, if you will. So you would take this cylinder and then you would put down clay, soft clay, and placing this on the soft clay, you would press and roll it on the clay. And in doing so, it would make an impression on here, which then you can read. So this is an exact copy of one of the four cylinders. and the structure that was being excavated uh, by Taylor back in 1854 was is thought to have been a temple to the Chaldean moon god named Sin. That's S-I-N, Sin. Sin was the god, one of the gods of the Chaldeans, and was worshipped even as far north as northern Canaan. Um, up around uh, the Sea of Galilee, just north of the Sea of Galilee, there are some images and idols of Sin all the way up into Galilee. Um, you can find this um, this idol god that was there. So he was a god. We don't know much about this god. Um, not like we know some of, like on Marduk or Baal or um, Ashtoreth or whatever. But we do know some things about him because they have found ancient documents about the god scene. Um, and these documents contain hymns that they obviously must have sang during their temple worship of him. And so we can gather from these hymns that he appears to be a, a god of cattle and herding and water. And I do have an image here, um, a picture that I've got of this god, seen god. He sort of looks like a bull with a picture of a moon and a sword. That is, um, this is actually a, um, a model. This is a replica. Uh, this one, actually, the photograph I'm showing you is a, uh, the actual one that was found up uh, north of the Sea of Galilee, about two kilometers north of the Sea of Galilee, what is probably in the ancient city of um, Geshur. 
um, on the outside of the gate. This is there. And um, that is an image of seen. Uh, so we know that he was worshipped from the, you know, even in ancient times. This thing probably dated just prior to David or during the reign of King Saul, this monument uh, of seen. But the thing is, he, uh, the Chaldeans, who existed for even before the time of David, um, had been worshipping this god. So um, he's sort of like a god, like a moon crest on top of his head or something like that. But that's who this god is. And he's the god of cattle, um, according to these hymns and agriculture and stuff. Um, so that is was found, like I say, at the at a place called Etel, uh, where some people say that was the ancient city um, of Vesteida, but that is um, that is not correct. Um, that is probably the city of Geshur. Um, but anyway, that's a whole different lesson that we'll get to in the future um, of where that was. But it's on the north side of the Sea of Galilee. But it gives you an image of what this god was. Now, this cylinder that we see here, um, this little tiny cylinder as we're looking at, um, this thing here, it does have writing on it. And you can see there's two different columns on this small thing. It's not very large. This is the actual size of this cylinder. Um, this artifact is a replica of one of the originals. Sometimes it is entitled in, in articles of magazines and scholarly works and stuff as it's often called the Nabonidus Cylinder. But wait a minute, Michael, we're talking about, about Belshazzar. But hold on, you're going to see because he's mentioned in here. This is the Nabonidus cylinder, um, though there are other ancient cylinders that have been discovered uh, containing information about the Babylonian king Nabonidus. This one seems to be prominently called the Nabonidus cylinder. This cylinder, as many of the other ones do, they do mention, um, like even the Cyrus cylinder from our previous lesson, they mention King Nabonidus. But this one here does something a little bit more. It mentions King Nabonidus' eldest son, whose name was, guess what, Belshazzar, and refers to him as the last king of Babylon. That's the city of Babylon. Now, part of the inscription, I can't read the Cunea writing on this, so I have to go through um, scholars who have translated this into English. But let me read you what this actually says on this cylinder, the English translation of it. Quote, as for me, Nabonidus, king of Babylon, save me from sinning against your great, uh, great godhood and grant me as a present a lifelong of days. And as for Belshazzar, the eldest son, my offspring, instill reverence for your great godhead in his heart, that he may not commit any cultic mistake. May he be sated with a life of plentitude, unquote. That is partially what you read on this cylinder, only translated into English. Now, what does this prove? What does this say that actually merits our discussion in this series? First of all, and this is a key one, critics often said Belshazzar was a mythical person. Uh, wrong! He was a real person. And he was the son of Nabonidus. And he's actually called on this the king of Babylon. So he did actually exist. Not only that, catch this, that he lived at the precise time that Daniel says he lived. Mm -hmm. Same time period. Still, skeptics will try and find fault in the book of Daniel. Oh, they will always try and find fault. And in chapter 5, Daniel writes that Nebuchadnezzar was the father of Belshazzar. Uh, where do we get this? Okay, here's another place where critics will often now, who, who acknowledge, yes, that Belshazzar, okay, you got me. Belshazzar was a, a real person. Okay, you got me. He was the king. But the Bible says he was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Where does it say this? Let's go to Daniel again, chapter 5, starting at verse 8 and going through verse 12. This is what we read. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then Belshazzar, greatly alarmed, and his color changed, and his lords were perplexed. The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy gods, in the days of your father, light and understanding 
and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, the enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers, because an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom your king, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show you the interpretation. Did you see where they find the error? We read here, the queen is telling King Belshazzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king. So right there, people will say the Bible's got an error, because we know that Belshazzar, even according to the cylinder, Belshazzar was not the, was not the son of, uh, it says on here that he is the son of Nabonidus, not the son of Nebuchadnezzar. So, oh, your Bible's wrong. And also other historical records um, record that, um, that Babylon, well, it didn't exist for a really long time. And, it, and there was only a few kings. This kingdom only lasted, the Babylonian Empire only lasted, not what, maybe 80 years. It was not a very long kingdom. Um, it didn't last long, so there's only a few kings. Just looking at the different kings of the Babylonian Empire, we see there was a guy by the name, the first major king was Nabopolassar, and he reigned from 625 to 605 BC. After him came Nebuchadnezzar, um, who reigned between 605 and 562. Nebuchadnezzar II. He was the one who conquered Jerusalem and most of the world. He's the one who brought the empire to its, its major extent. After him, for a short period of time, from 561 to 560, was um, Evil Murdoch. And then, for a short period after him, for just a few years, 559 to 556 BC, there was uh, Nerig Ilasser, who reigned. And following him, there was Labashi Marduk, who reigned he didn't even make it a full year. He was very short in time. Then finally, Nabonidus becomes the king. He reigns from 555 to 539. So he has the second longest reign here, it seems like. So he's reigning. And then after him, as it says, his eldest son, Belshazzar, is the king. And he is king from 552 uh, to 542. So he reigned about 10 years. Now, that's a short list of kings. Some of these kings as I say, ruled a long time, like Nebuchadnezzar II, he ruled a long time. Others, really short, only, only a, a, not even a couple of months. Nonetheless, one can see from this list that we're showing you here that Belshazzar is not a direct descendant of Nebuchadnezzar, that he's not the son of Nebuchadnezzar. No, he's not. Um, and, and critics love to point this out to me and to other Christians. They love to point this out, trying to show you an apparent error in the Bible. Well, if you're a Christian, how do you answer this? Can the Bible still be correct? Yes, it can. It, it's very simple to figure out. As we know, Belshazzar was the eldest son, according to this cylinder. Belshazzar is the oldest son of Nabonidus. But if you follow the bloodline of these kings, you will discover something. Belshazzar, remember some of these reigns are very short in between, is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar II. Yes, there were some in between. There were some really weird things taking place in this kingdom. He is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar II. Now, it doesn't say this in the cylinder, but we know this from other historical records. But you see, this was common in the ancient world to use the term father or the term son as a dynastic predecessor or successor. It's very common. We see this, we use this all the time. Even critics use this, um, this type of a thing. For instance, there is um, an artifact called the Black Obelisk, discovered while excavating Nimrud in Assyria, present-day Iraq, uh, that contains information dealing with the life of King Shalamanzer III, who he's recorded in the Bible also, who defeated the Syrians, and then received tribute also from um, the Kingdom of Israel and King Jehu. Matter of fact, on this obelisk, we have an image of King Jehu actually bowing before Shalemanser, um, bowing at the feet and kissing the feet of Shalemanser III. Um, they're presented on this artifact. You can see the artwork actually carved into the stone on this. Now, um, on this artifact, this monument, there's writing above where the picture is, where you see, and that is King Jehus down on all fours at the foot of uh, 
uh, shall a man answer the third? And but you'll notice above that there is writing, and in this writing it refers to Jehu as the son of King Omri. Now King Omri is also mentioned in the Bible, but there were no blood relations between the two of them at all. Yet he's called the son of Jehu was the fourth king of Israel after Omri. So there was Omri, then some other kings, and then Jehu. Jehu executed Omri's descendants to gain the throne. He's not a blood relative, but he is in the dynasty of the kings. So because he's in this dynastic description, that's why he's called the son of Omri. He wasn't his direct descendant at all but he was in succession of him. So it was, it's very common for him to be referred to as a son. But there's an even better example of this. How about Jesus himself? How many times we read Jesus, the Messiah, is referred to as the son of David? Now, is Jesus a direct descendant of, of uh, David, King David? Of course not. There's a thousand years span between um, their periods of time when they walked the earth. But Jesus is a direct descendant of David. We see this from Matthew's account. As Matthew starts his book, we see that David, and also Luke tells us too, that, that Jesus is a descendant of David. We get that. But like I say, there's over a thousand years of generation between. But even so, he is a descendant, a direct descendant of him. And this is the same way this works within the Daniel account. Belshazzar, as it says in here, is the son we know of, Nabonidus, but we know from history he was also in one of the kings of Babylon. So he is in the dynastic um, lineage that way of being a son of Nebuchadnezzar. Actually, this is, like I say, his grandfather. Um, and that's how this all appears. So it's not an error. It's a way of referring to dynastic um, uh, successors of a kingdom. That's how it's mentioned. So that explains it. So there is no error here. What we see is stuff, uh, these, this little cylinder adding to the support that the book of Daniel is accurate, that the Bible is accurate. Isn't that cool? Well, I want to thank you so much because this concludes our series that we've been doing on Daniel, archaeology, and, uh, and the Bible concerning Daniel. And I hope you have really enjoyed this. And uh, as I've presented these different artifacts that we've looked at, showing you how accurate the Bible really is. Um, this is an amazing book. It's not an ordinary book. It's a gift from God. It's inspired by God, the true God, who is the God of truth. And he doesn't make errors like that. So it is amazing. You can put your faith in this. And we'd love to hear from you if you have comments you want to share um, about these lessons or just about what Evidence for Faith is all about. We would love to, to hear from you. We'd love, uh, we covered your prayers for our ministry, and we'd ask you to if God leads you to help support us, pray for us at least, we ask for that. And um, I just enjoy having you join us this way in these le uh, these lessons. So stay tuned. Look at our website for other lessons that will be coming up on, on science in the Bible, archaeology in the Bible, Bible lessons themselves, because we keep putting out more and more stuff, which is why we, we ask for help, because this is a um, uh, a missionary type of funding. We We pay people. Um, a salary to do this, but the thing is, we don't charge for going out and doing seminars. If you'd love to have me come and speak on some of these uh, artifacts and evidence for the Bible, please contact us at evidenceforfaith.org, and you can get um, in touch with us this way, because we would love to come do a workshop um, or help out in any some way we can with youth ministries, children's ministries, or adult ministries, anything like that. We'd love to hear from you. So until we meet again, take care and God be blessed. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you to our donors who make this program possible. Evidence for Faith is a 501c3 nonprofit ministry based in the USA. You can support this broadcast by donating online using the links in the description. And don't forget to leave us a comment, a review, likes, and shares to feed the algorithm and help others find this content. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the next episode.